Okay, so as Amar said, my name is Arun Kumar. I'm an associate professor in computer science and engineering. I'm also one of the founding faculty members at the Halo Jolu Data Science Institute, um, which is a department of data science from scratch that we started four years ago. It's great to be here at COD's COMAD. I've been, I've known about this conference since I was an undergraduate student at IIT Madras in, in India back in 2005 to nine. And I've uh, worked with database faculty, ML and data mining faculty and network systems faculty there. I visited them recently as well, but I've never got to attend a conference. So apologies, I couldn't attend in person this time. Hopefully I can attend in person in the future. So what is this debification of ML AI? Let's get started. Uh, okay, there we go. Now it's no secret that we are now in the golden age of machine learning and AI. All the major web companies are using this extensively for all sorts of applications. And this has created enormous excitement in various enterprise sectors like healthcare, insurance, retail, telecom, finance, and even in academic domains like the domain sciences, digital humanities, for tools and products that make it easier for them to integrate ML and AI into their data analytics applications. And this sort of, um, sorry, this sort of space, the International Data Corporation, which is a market research firm that studies this uh, data products landscape, they estimate that the um, market size is gonna hit almost half a trillion dollars per year by the end of next year. That's an astonishingly large figure, but that's what the IDC estimates. Naturally, there's a lot of activity in this space with several open source tools that are wildly popular. And all the major cloud companies are also creating uh, software as a service offerings for ML and AI. And they all want a slice of this pie. However, as I will talk about today, despite all of these advances, there still remain numerous fundamental bottlenecks in the end-to-end -end process of building and deploying machine learning and AI powered data analytics applications. And these are bottlenecks that are of both efficiency and usability. And that's what I study fundamentally in my work. I build abstractions, algorithms, and software systems that democratize ML and AI by mitigating these bottlenecks from the data management and system standpoint. And by democratization, I mean precisely the following improve the system efficiency, so of the software systems, of the tools used reduce the runtimes and costs, and also improve the human efficiency, which is improving the productivity of the people involved in the loop, the data scientists and the ML engineers and so on. Now, to do this, we need to bring together the worlds of data management and ML AI, and also straddle the whole system stack. And so in my research, um, I more precisely build practical and scalable data systems for ML and AI analytics, that are inspired by relational database systems principles that we've studied for almost half a century now, but I also exploit insights from statistical and computational learning theory and optimization theory, which are at the root of what ML computations are about. So I have interacted with almost four dozen data practitioners, ML practitioners, data scientists, ML engineers, data analysts, business analysts, DevOps and ML ops people, and also domain scientists to understand the end-to-end -end application lifecycle of ML and AI-based data analytics. And based on my conversations, I divide this lifecycle into three main stages, source, build, and deploy. In the source stage, these data practitioners are responsible for converting the raw data in their applications, like multi-table relational databases, text corpora, multimedia, and time series data, into a form that is amenable for ML to be applied, ML-ready data sets. In the build stage, they take those ML-ready data sets, construct models, do model selection procedures like hyperparameter tuning and feature selection and feature engineering to build models and prediction pipelines that can be used for prediction. In the deploy stage, they take these prediction pipelines, integrate it with the application to make these predictions either on offline business intelligence use cases like for presentation and reporting purposes or online for web companies, IOT companies, and so on, where inference requests arrive at a kind of real-time manner. And data is not static applications or not static. They have to monitor and maintain these pipelines over the life cycle of the application as the data evolves, as the schema evolves, as the application evolves. All of this, they do this on top of data systems and ML systems. 
So in this context, my research approach has been to identify these fundamental bottlenecks for usability and efficiency by both based on my conversations with practitioners and my understanding of the space, I abstract out the key steps. Then I formalize the computations, both from the data flow standpoint and from the statistical and ML standpoint. This allows us to automate grunt work, reduce the amount of manual work they need to do and offload more of the work to the system as much as possible while maintaining the inputs that the data scientists still uh, can provide in a valuable way. And because we have formalized the computation, we can use database and systems techniques that we know and love to optimize the execution in the ML context. And the link down there, Ada Lab UCSD, is the name of my research group. All our research projects, papers are listed there. I invite you to take a look if you're curious about all the projects I've worked on. In today's talk, I'll focus on a couple of those. Um, sorry, just a second. The slide is not moving. Okay, there we go. So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. I'll explain what I mean by the debification of MLAI, and then I'll talk about some examples, two examples from my research, and then I'll talk about how we can accelerate this debification of MLAI. So now if you look at machine learning, what do they worry about? Overwhelmingly, they worry about accuracy, prediction accuracy. There's like dozens of metrics for this. There's like zero one loss, there's, um, blue score, precision recall, all of these things. Sometimes they also worry about runtime efficiency, primarily in terms of complexity of training and inference and so on. But in the ML systems world, there are several practical concerns that need to be tackled on top of these issues. Um, so sorry, let me bring this slide. Some of these concerns are familiar to us. What if the data set is too large to fit on your machine memory? That is a concern of scalability. How are the features and models configured? That is the concern of usability. How do these ML pipelines fit within production workflows and systems? That is the concern of manageability. And on top of all of this, we want to make sure we're able to build these software systems in a way that is easier for develop developers. And so that is the concern of developability. So if you look at all of these concerns, we have studied all of this in the database systems context, in the relational database systems context, for almost four decades now. However, that was for relational and SQL computations. Now we have to study this for ML computations as well. One key twist in the ML context is often you can trade off accuracy a bit to gain on one or more of these enormously. So that leads to novel, interesting kind of technical questions as well. Now, I'm not the only one saying this. The industry has also been talking about platformizing ML. And this particular paper from Google has been widely read. It's very influential in technical data and machine learning systems. The NIPS conference, now the new NIPS conference. And you see, they talk about how ML code is this tiny piece in the middle of this giant complex ecosystem that involves data collection, feature extraction, process management, serving, and so on. And so this sort of platformizing ML is not new. It has been happening for decades, literally. So let's do a brief history recap. Back in the 1980s, the SAS Institute was started, and they are still very popular in the enterprise world for data analytics. In the open source world, the S language was started from the statistics community, which evolved into the R language in the 90s, and R is still widely popular in many statistical communities, including biostats and so on. But it's only in the late 90s that the database systems community got involved. They started building what are called in RDBMS ML systems or in database data mining toolkits. The purpose of these is to bring ML algorithms closer to where the data reside in relational DBMSs. So it can run in the process space of these relational DBMSs, you can invoke it from the SQL console and so on. IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, all the big database vendors had these sorts of in database mining products. Later in the mid 2000s, people realized that implementing these ML algorithms in a scalable way on large scale data is more complex. Instead of building everything one after another, can we use abstractions of systems on top of these? And this is where ML systems abstractions came about. Graph Lab, Madlib, which is a project I've been involved with, Parameter Server, and then Dataflow systems also started taking off in the early 2010s. And people started building libraries on top of them, like MapReduce, Apache Mahout, and Spark, they have their Spark MLlib on top of Spark RDDs. 
So these sorts of ML systems also made it easier to use ML on large scale data. But in the last half a decade to three quarters of a decade, there has been an explosion of activity in this space. Um, and in particular, tree learning systems for gradient boosted decision trees like XGBoost and LightGBM have become very popular on structured data. And on unstructured data like text, images, audio, video, deep learning systems are the way to go now. TensorFlow and PyTorch in particular have gained massive adoption. And these systems are classes of data systems that are optimized for these machine learning data access patterns. And in the last half a decade or so, cloud AI services have abstracted away the implementation details. They allow you to do elastic scaling and so on. SageMaker is a good example. Vertex AI from Google, Azure ML from Microsoft. And there's also classes of systems for orchestrating the whole life cycle of ML called ML platforms like TensorFlow Extended, MLflow, and also a specific subset of that called feature stores to reuse and manage feature generation. Tecton is a good example. They have also started building these sorts of systems and it's led to this new community at the intersection of ML and data systems. So it's an exciting space with a lot of activity, both in research and in industry, also in the startup world. The way I see it, this rise of ML systems and platforms resembles the rise of relational DBMSs as a category of software systems circa early 1980s. That's when people saw the merits of the relational model, SQL, and it started, we started building these software systems to democratize the access to those sorts of computations. Same thing is happening with ML computations. People are building these sorts of ML systems and platforms. That is what I call the new DBification of ML AI systematizing and building out these sorts of systems and platforms to make it easier and faster and cheaper to adopt ML and AI. This is not just an industrial endeavor. There are several open research questions across this whole life cycle that need to be tackled by academia and by industry. And in terms of specific problems, some of these examples are important problems in the sourcing stage, for example, metadata management is very critical. Often there's a lot of transformations that are taking place, multiple data sets united in kind of building models, experimentation and so on. Data preparation and cleaning for ML remains a huge bottleneck. Often there's a lot of manual grunt work involved there. How do we make that more automated? Multimodal query models matter. We've focused a lot on structured data, some semi-structured data, but often in the real world data sets are multimodal. There's images and text and tabular that needs to be mixed. How do we reason about these sorts of data sets? Data search systems are very important on data lakes, for example, where you can have literally thousands, tens of thousands of data sets sitting around. How do we make sure you get the right data for your task in a, an efficient way? Labeling systems, often for supervised ML, you need to write programmatic labels, heuristic labels, and so on. So there's a lot of work there as well. Now on this build and deploy side, there's a lot of challenging systems problems to do scalable data systems for ML execution, both for training and inference. Query optimization matters in this context as well, just as query optimization matters for relational and SQL and other sorts of workloads, query optimization matters for ML workloads as well. How do we make sure that we optimize the resource efficiency of these two systems? And increasingly analytics workloads are moving to public clouds. So cloud native infrastructure is a big deal. How do we make them elastic? How do we make them fault tolerant? How do we make them delay tolerant? And also streaming infrastructure, serverless infrastructure, building systems in that context also matters. And across this life cycle, there are so many moving parts. If something fails, if a prediction is wrong, how do you debug that? So providence management and debugging techniques for these sorts of data ML pipelines is also a big open question. And across this whole life cycle, we need to understand not just what to build, but also how do we evaluate what we have built? Benchmarking is very critical. And here we're talking benchmark frameworks, benchmarking the tools for the data systems for the ML systems used in this context, but also benchmark label data set to understand say automation of some of these things like data preparation. And just as with any other data computations here, fairness, transparency, privacy, security, many of these overarching concerns also matter, not just efficiency and usability. So there's a lot of open problems here that we can contribute to. Let me dive into two concrete examples from my research to highlight this debification of ML. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I think the slides won't. Let me just move it back. 
Um, sorry, just a second. Okay, there we go. First, um, I will talk about our work on scalable deep learning systems, and then I'll talk briefly about our work on automated data preparation for ML. Um, sorry, the slide seems to have frozen again. Okay, great. So when you think of deep learning, how do you build deep learning models? You specify your training task, your neural computational graph in a PyTorch or TensorFlow, and then you run it on a cluster of GPUs, maybe managed with Kubernetes. This is a pretty rosy picture. In reality, there's a lot more that takes place to train deep learning models. Model building is never one and done. You need to run model selection, which is the process of tuning hyperparameters, architectures, data representations, inputs, outputs. There's a lot of experimentation involved. This needs to happen efficiently at scale. So this is where we stepped in with Project Cerebro to understand this overarching process of model selection and deep learning. Build scalable systems that make this process easier, faster, and cheaper. So what does Cerebro do? You still specify your deep learning workloads using PyTorch and TensorFlow, but you now specify the model selection process more holistically using APIs like Keras, AutoML tools, and so on. There, you're now training multiple models on the same data set, and you're going to compare them. At this stage, Cerebro intervenes in the middleware system. It takes the specification that's at the higher level, applies what we call multi-query optimization. Now that's a database system term. Through these deep learning tools, then it places the computations for you on the cluster. This basically is what we call logical physical decoupling in the database world. You separate the what of the computation from the how of the execution. This is the core of how relational DBMSs have these query optimizers that make it much faster to run SQL queries rather than you writing low-level code to access data. So we are bringing this philosophy to the deep learning systems world. By decoupling this sort of specification from the execution, we also enable portability. The same code stack can now be used for um, a different cluster environment. Maybe you're running it in a cloud-native manner. Maybe you're running it on Spark. We've actually integrated Cerebro with Spark, for example, and also Greenplum, a parallel data warehouse. So this means applications can change their architectures, their modeling, and their pipeline, but the execution engine has decoupled it. And so now they don't need to rebuild their code stack or a different cluster environment. So what does this mean exactly? What does multi-query optimization look like for deep learning model selection? Let's start with a key example. And this is the first paper we published in this project. We've subsequently had several scenarios where we have shown the benefit of multi-query optimization. And so here, in this context, we're going to look at this hyperparameter tuning workload. Often, when you're training these deep learning models, you have to tune learning rate, you need to tune regularization, and so on. And you use these heuristics like grid search and random search, or AutoML heuristics like hyperband, ASHA, hyperop. They construct many training configurations, potentially even hundreds of training configurations. And this is something that uh, many ML conferences now require you to specify in your paper, what where the hyperparameter sweeps you have done, and so on. So in this context, the multi-query specification is really you're training multiple models on the same training data set. And so that is why this is a multi-query execution problem. How does this work? before we came in? How did this work before we came in? We proposed a new execution strategy called model hopper parallelism. Let me explain it by first comparing it to prior art and then say what is different than what prior art had. So in the ML world, the most common way for executing these sorts of model selection workloads is what is called task parallelism. You take a cluster, you have a bunch of models you need to train, you assign one model to each worker in your cluster. So here, for example, I'm training three models, maybe three different hyperparameter or architectures. I have copied the data set to every worker. And so you see the data set D is copied to worker one, two, and three. And now I'm running them in parallel. So this is called task parallelism. The advantage of this is that now you get high throughput. You're training several models in parallel. That's great. Another advantage is from the ML accuracy standpoint, Every model is seeing the data in a sequential manner, so that gives you gold standard accuracy for SGD. However, from the system standpoint, this is very poor on data scalability. 
you're literally copying the data set. Now, if you have a terabyte size data set and you have eight machines, it bloats to eight terabytes, storage footprint, memory footprint, all of that gets wasted. Now you could say, okay, why don't I store it in a remote storage like S3 and then read it repeatedly instead of copying the data set. To do that, you're going to waste the network because SGD for training deep learning models is iterative. Often you run dozens of epochs. So now you will end up reading the data hundreds of times over the network, dramatically wasting the network and flooding it with redundant data. So that's the state of the art before we looked at this from the task parallelism side. In the database community and in the systems community, they had this approach called data parallelism. The data parallel approach works as follows. You again have a cluster of workers, but then you have some servers or manager nodes. You shard the data and you put it on these workers. So here notice that D is being split into D1, D2, D3. So every worker has a subset of the data. Now you run the same model on all the workers, and then you reconcile by exchanging information about gradient updates, about the parameters. There is several variants of this. There's parameter server approach, and then there is a decentralized approach called Horovod. All of these, what they do is they communicate updates across these workers at every mini batch level. Now, in a particular data set for SGD, the mini batch sizes are small. They're typically a dozen or few dozens to a few hundreds of examples. But the data set itself might be massive. You could have millions of examples. So while the advantage of high data scalability occurs for data parallelism, a disadvantage is it leads to enormous amounts of communication. If you exchange updates only after looking at a shard, that is called model averaging, that does not converge for deep learning because it's a non-convex problem. So you have to exchange at every mini batch which forces you to communicate thousands of times. And that means you lead to a lot of resource idling on the GPUs and your throughput for model selection is very low. So this was a dichotomous world that we saw and we realized this is a false dichotomy. We wanted the best of both worlds and that is what MOP is. It's a hybrid of data parallelism and task parallelism that offers the benefits of both without the disadvantages of either. So let's look at how MOP actually works. Um, let's see, the slide is not moving. Let me check what's going on. Okay, there we go. MOP is fundamentally rooted in an insight from optimization theory, which tells us that stochastic gradient descent does not care in what order you visit the data, the training data, as long as it is some random order. So this is why often people shuffle the data set. So you randomly reorder your examples, and then you get the data, uh, kind of access the data. It's basically sampling without replacement. That is how SGD is practiced. How do we exploit this in Cerebro? So first, we shuffle the data set, we partition it, put the shards on the different workers. This is akin to what data parallelism does. So notice that D1, D2, D3, D4, they're on different workers. But now, unlike the data parallel execution, which runs one model on the whole cluster, we now put different models on the different workers, and then we start them in parallel. So, sorry, just a second. So notice that you have these four models. Each model starts its training process on the local shard of the data. So D1, D2, D3, D4. You have four different models training on the local shard of the data. So they run their mini batch updates using only the local data for the first epoch. Now at this stage, you checkpoint the models, you hop across the workers, and now you have moved model one to the second worker. Once you do this, you now restart that model on that new worker shard. So model one has moved to the second worker, it restarts the same epoch on the second shard. This is why it's called model hopper. The models hop across the machines to visit all the shards. And as the models keep hopping across all these machines, they see all of the data set exactly once. So model one hops across the machines, sees all the shards. Likewise, every other model hops across machines. All this hopping happens in parallel. There is no synchronization point that is necessary. This means every model has seen the whole data set. And you don't need to communicate for every mini batch. You only communicate once per shard. 
This allows us to offer two strong theoretical guarantees. Um, sorry, slides are kind of slow. One, since every model visits the whole data set in a sequential order, you get gold standard accuracy. It's equivalent, logically equivalent to sequential SGD. You get the same behavior as task parallelism for accuracy. But we also showed in the paper that this approach of hopping after every shard hits the lower bound on communication costs. So if you compare the communication cost, this is the best possible approach for data parallel model selection. So we published the results in VLDB. I invite you to take a look at the paper. Let me quickly share some key results. Um, before that, the main challenges, this sounds simple enough. There is some interesting systems issues in actually making this practical. We need to build a resource aware scheduler. And so we've done this scheduler that generalizes what we call open shop scheduling. You don't need to synchronize between the shards movement of the models. It's the first known form of what we call bulk asynchronous parallelism. In the database where we know bulk synchronous parallelism, this is the first instance of bulk asynchronous parallelism. And we've also shown that this approach is amenable to easily supporting data replication. We want to have more parallelism and fault tolerance. It can work elastically. And all of this can be done without needing to modify the internals of TensorFlow or PyTorch. So you can just integrate it with existing systems. We've integrated it with both of those tools in a non-disruptive manner. This allows backward compatibility. Tomorrow, if PyTorch, Facebook, uh, Google, TensorFlow, they improve their compilers for the computational graphs, we can just use that as a drop-in replacement here. We are not changing the compiler. We don't need to change the interface for the hardware. OK. How does this actually work? Does this actually give you better results compared to prior? Up? Here's an experiment from the paper. And this is a benchmark experiment. This is the ImageNet benchmark, which is a computer vision task. We used 16 CNNs, two models, and eight different hyperparameters for each. So standard configurations, ResNet models, implemented in TensorFlow. We had a six node cluster on campus. Each machine had a GPU. And these are standard commodity GPUs that academics use. And so this is a very common setting in many enterprises and many academic settings. We're going to compare. We're going to show two things, the learning curves and system metrics. So learning curve, we are plotting the epoch on the x-axis and the benchmark accuracy metric, which is top five validation error, on the y-axis. We're going to compare five systems. TensorFlow model averaging, which comes with TensorFlow. It exchanges updates only once per shard. Parameter server, especially asynchronous parameter server, which also comes with TensorFlow. Hot award, which is the state of the art data parallel tool. Celery, which is a task, task parallel tool. You could also use Dask or Ray. They give the same results. And Cerebro. So let's see what the learning curve looks like for these five different approaches as you keep training these models. Model averaging does not convert. Horovod and parameter server actually do well. In fact, Horovod can match parameter server. They converge to a really good accuracy on the benchmark metric. Now, the Horovod gap is basically because of a mini batch technicality. You can make it match the TensorFlow parameter server accuracy, but that's just a minor detail. So, task parallelism and uh, Cerebro match the accuracy of TensorFlow Parameter Server, you get the best accuracy for both. And notice that Cerebro and Celery are virtually indistinguishable on the learning curve. But now, let's look at the system metrics. These three systems, Parameter Server Asynchronous is almost 10 times slower than Celery or Cerebro. Horovod is about three times slower. Model averaging is comparable in runtime, but notice that it does not convert on accuracy. So between task parallelism and Cerebro, the memory footprint of Celery is eight times that of Cerebro because you have eight machines copying the data set to all those machines bloats your memory footprint. So overall, taking into account resource metrics like runtime and memory and accuracy metrics, Cerebro offers the best combination. In the paper, we have more experiments with other benchmark data sets. AutoML workloads and kind of detailed system analysis or why Cerebro does so well. Okay, so that is with the model hopper parallelism. The full vision of Cerebro, we published this at CIDR a couple of years ago, involves a lot more. There's we've abstracted 
deep learning model selection into these high high level model building APIs, hyperparameter tuning, transfer learning, sequence analysis, feature transfer, ML over groups, training separate models for separate groups in the data. All of these can be specified in a high level API that users are already familiar with. And so they can use their regular command line interfaces, Jupyter notebooks, or graphical user interfaces for the specification. Under the hood, at the lowest level, execution and storage can happen on any cluster. It could be on Kubernetes clusters, access the file system directly, it could be on data flow systems like Spark or Greenplum, or it could run on a cloud native engine like AWS. In between is our secret sauce, the optimization and scheduling layer where we have these hybrid parallelism techniques like model hopper parallelism. We have several others that we have devised in the last few years and also the materialization and memory management for transfer learning. These are sort of the first time these sorts of data systems concepts have been studied in the deep learning context. And all of this wraps around auto diff and SGD execution, which is offered by TensorFlow and PyTorch. So we don't need to change the internals of TensorFlow and PyTorch. All of this provides scalability and resource efficiency on top of those sorts of tools. And so this is Cerebro, a layered data platform where we took the lessons of relational DBMSs and brought it to the deep learning world to enable much higher scalability and resource efficiency than prior art. On the side, Cerebro also uses tools like MLflow and TensorBoard to allow you to visualize results, manage metadata. So these are standard tasks that are needed when you're training so many models. And we also support all in a fault tolerant and elastic manner. So I invite you to take a look at the CIDR paper if you're interested more in this region of why we designed Cerebro on this paper. Overall, it's the first model selection first data platform with this layered architecture for large scale deep learning. It offers higher level specifications that data scientists are already familiar with, combined with novel multi query optimization techniques that bring together these three worlds of databases, systems, and ML to offer better resource efficiency and higher deep learning user productivity. And so I hope this kind of gave you a good example of what DBification of ML really means. You want to reimagine the ML world in the same way we built the database systems world. And so that's a very ambitious task. And obviously it's not just for one person. Oh, sorry, I think it jumped a slide. Um, Cerebro, I'm happy to say, has been used by domain scientists here on campus. We've been collaborating with public health folks and we've produced models that are trained on terabyte size accelerometer time series data for predicting sedentary behaviors of people. It's been used to understand exercise activities of people in assisted living facilities, people with obesity, breast cancer survivors, and so on. So it's really nice to be able to build systems that can be used to improve public health. We're also collaborating with computational physicists to apply some of these techniques. The same thing that we did for data scaling, we've done for model scaling as well. And so we now we are doing fluid dynamic simulation, amplifying their models as well. Apache Madlib, which is an open source project from Pivotal and now VMware, collaborated with us to adopt model hub of parallelism. It's now available as part of Madlib and they're using it for their custom workloads. We have integrated this with Spark and that is open sourced as well. And Databricks is exploring this to apply to their customer workloads now. And in the near future, we'll release more open source tools for transfer learning, for graph neural nets, and so on, all of which revolve around this philosophy of multi-query optimization for deep learning systems. And I'd like to thank all these agencies that funded this research. I can see it's a diverse set of organizations from industry to health to basic science. And the San Diego Supercomputer Center here at UCSD is also planning to adopt Cerebro to make it available to all domain scientists on campus. Okay, so that's it with the scalable deep learning systems. Um, should we take questions now or shall I move on to the support? Perhaps better to move on to the second part and then I can take all the questions at the end. So here. There is a question now. Okay, sure. I can take a question now. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Can you hear Arun? I can hear you, but only lightly. No, oh, I have a question. Yes. Hi, sir. So I want to ask, uh, so uh, with uh, OpenAI and with some
some other uh, organizations uh, allowing some uh, API based uh, platforms where we can uh, just uh, query the API. How do you feel uh, that uh, Cerebro fit, will fit in uh, in this uh, new ecosystem that is slowly developing where you can uh, use uh, a direct API instead of building your own models? which are uh, uh, becoming more and more large day by day? That's a great question. So two answers to that. One is the providers of these APIs have to tackle some of these issues internally. So OpenAI, for example, can benefit from some of the techniques that we are talking about. So that is one way. The second way is even though the API-based approach works for some commodity use cases, Increasingly, many enterprises are worried about data privacy, and so they don't want to send their data to third-party vendors. What they are doing is they're downloading these models and fine-tuning them. And so there, you would have non-OpenAI or maybe a third party that is offering these fine-tuning services where they will run into these same bottlenecks. Now, you won't be training it on large data. You'll have to grapple with large models. And so we have some separate work on model scaling that applies similar hybrid parallelism techniques. Okay. Okay, great. Let's see if there's a way to get back to the slide. I now see the question slide. Can you see the question? Arun? Yes. Yes, the question is, in the end-to-end -end ML pipeline, we may not need, uh, should I take that question now? Uh, yes, yes. That's okay. Fine. Yeah, sure. So. I can read. Yes. So basically, the question asks: um, We may not need explicit models or features. It may be more from selecting from large pre-trained models. So again, I think going back to the point I made earlier, in certain commodity applications, like say speech recognition or sentiment mining, people may not need to train their models anymore. I think these are what inference APIs can provide, like uh, SageMaker inference for computer vision and language processing. But in many other applications, they still have to fine tune on their local private data. And there will be tons of bespoke staff where they might have to fine tune these models. And so there you would have to download and kind of not train from scratch, but fine tune these sorts of models. Okay. okay, let's continue with the lecture now, I think. Okay, sounds good. I can take more questions at the end as well. Uh, let me see if this is moving forward. Okay, the second part, Automated data preparation. This is a shifting gears a little bit. It's a very different world. In this world, you're talking about tabular data. And on tabular data, people don't use deep learning that much. They still use classical machine learning methods. Still a lot of data preparation and transformation and feature extraction that goes on. But what we saw was in the last few years, automated ML has become popular. These auto ML tools like SageMaker Autopilot, Salesforce Einstein, are now used on tens of thousands of companies for either getting a baseline ML model out or augmenting the data scientist teams or sometimes reducing the data scientist work as well. These tools, although they are popular, they are now starting to expand the capabilities of automation. And in particular, some of them are claiming they have automated data preparation as well. Now in the database community, we know data preparation has been studied for like three decades now, a very hard manual task. But like Transmogrify, which is a tool for automated data prep in Einstein, claims that they have solved it. SageMaker Autopilot claims they have automatically transformed data. TensorFlow Extended, they have their auto TFX as well, which does some transformations, and they claim they can also automate some of this. Thing. So we look at this landscape of tools that claim they have automated data preparation. And looking at all of this, it made me wonder, hmm, just how good is this automation? This is a scientific question. The industry is claiming they have automated this, but automation is no good if it is crappy. If your automation is not accurate, it's not useful. And then we realized that shockingly, no one knows objectively how good the automation of data prep by such tools really is. And that is where we set about studying this in the Sorting Head project. And we published a vision paper at the Dean workshop about this, ML Data Prep 2. Our basic idea is we need benchmark data sets to systematically compare these tools that are claiming they've automated some of these tasks. 
So what does a benchmark look like for machine learning data preparation? We believe there's like three important components that need to be covered by any such benchmark. The first one is you need to formally define the task. And this basically means what are the inputs? What are the outputs? You have to say this is the semantics of the task and this is how this is converted to that. Second one is you need pairs of input output examples. That's your label data set. And it should be sufficiently large to assess accuracy reliably. And the third one is it's not enough to just automate the data prep task. You need to see how valuable is it in the ML pipeline? Does it actually improve the model's accuracy, the downstream model's accuracy? And so you need to have downstream benchmark as well. So these three components formulate a machine learning data prep benchmark. Now, from a fundamental scientific standpoint, we realize that there is a, several open questions here that people have not really paid attention to. In particular, um, sorry, let me call this. Data preparation has been studied for business intelligence and SQL context. But in the ML context, data preparation affects ML accuracy. How exactly does it affect accuracy? Different data prep steps affect it differently. And so this results in bias changes, variance changes, noise changes. So there's bias variance trade-off, which is integral to ML accuracy. People don't really understand this deeply. And so this is an open area that we decided to study. And I think there's a lot of rich open questions here. Why should we understand it? Not just for our own intellectual curiosity, but if we understand it, we can build fail safes for auto ML tools. So if they make errors, they can potentially stand in with other alternative pathways to mitigate those errors and not affect downstream predictions. So this is sort of why we started studying this um, data prep accuracy and impact on ML. In the ML data prep soon, now this is a probably a daunting diagram. Um, let me just walk through this. Let's say you have your table, which is a raw database table exported from your database of customers, and you want to predict customer churn, you have to first do a task called schema inference. So this is basically feature type inference. For example, age is stored as an integer. It's a numeric feature for a map. Zip code is also stored as an integer, but it is not a numeric feature for a map. You have to intervene and cast it as a categorical feature. If you use zip code as a number, in a logistic regression or decision tree model, it could give you garbage results. So somebody has to intervene and cast it as a categorical. Likewise, income is mostly numeric, but there's like string somewhere. So the whole column is a string column in the database, but for the ML schema, it should be cast as a number and you have to extract the number. So we define this taxonomy of common data prep tasks that occur in the ML pipeline context. And we studied some of these systematically. We devised benchmark data sets for this. This is by no means comprehensive. There are literally dozens, if not hundreds of tasks that take place in the end-to-end -end pipeline. We need to start systematizing this tasks that are common. And these tasks that we devised were based on our survey of open source data prep automation tools and auto ML tools. These tools do all of this in a rule-based kind of heuristic manner. We showed that by building label data sets for these sorts of tasks, we can substantially boost accuracy. And if you're interested, I invite, you uh, invite you to take a look at the Sigmod 21 paper where we did this for the schema inference task in particular. We found that Salesforce, AutoGluon, TFX, many of these industrial AutoML tools fall substantially short in the accuracy of detecting feature types using their rule-based approaches. And a simple random forest trained on our label data with commodity features actually gave substantive accuracy boost. Um, that's one. Sorry, I think the slides are kind of not moving fast. Okay. Now, just like with Cerebro, I like collaborating with industry to translate our research to practice. And here, I've, we've been fortunate to collaborate with Google. They've adopted some of the models we built for type inference, integrated this with TensorFlow data validation and TFX, and they're benchmarking it on their internal automobile benchmarks. We're also using this for a model plus data set search tool called AI Maker. And OpenML, which is this community repository for data science pipeline, has also adopted this. AutoGluon from Amazon, they also adopted this, and they're using it for some of their end-to-end um, -end tabular AutoML use cases as well. OK, so those are the two examples that I wanted to highlight. There's several other open problems. And of course, it's not possible for one person to study everything. And so this is why I hope this can become a community effort to study all these sorts of problems. 
Leaving these sorts of problems at this intersection open will result in a huge waste of time, effort by practitioners, money for these companies and domain scientists, and also energy, especially in the deep learning context, by all sorts of users of ML and AI. And so it's really a shirking of our intellectual responsibility to science and to wider society if we don't study and solve these sorts of issues. And I believe it's high time for the database community and the ML, AI, and data mining communities and other areas of CS to join forces to accelerate this debification of ML and AI. Okay, how exactly are we going to do this? How do we accelerate the debification of ML? I hopefully I'm convinced that there's a lot of exciting problems to study here. What can you do if you want to join this sort of research direction? And these are just my thoughts. These are no means, again, comprehensive. But based on my experience, these are some of the thoughts I'd like to share about this. First, you have to learn the fundamentals of ML AI algorithms and potentially ML theory. This is kind of like learning the basics of logic, relational algebra, and SQL. If you want to work on relational DBMSs. Now, you could do this with courses at your institution. You could, these are some of the books that I really like Trevor Hasty, Tom Mitchell, Aaron Kurville, and so on. But you don't have to read everything up front. If you're working on deep learning systems, you need to understand deep learning algorithms. If you're working on ML accuracy trade offs, you can understand the bias variance theory and so on. And recently, double descent theory. So that's this need to know spectrum. The second is um, you could check out courses. Now, some of you graduate students who are looking for research topics, there are these graduate courses on data systems for ML. I created one of the first ones in the world on data systems for ML, and its videos are available on YouTube. Lecture slides are available from my 2021 edition. Please do take a look at that. And we also worked with uh, Matthias Bohm at um, now to you Berlin and Jun Yang at Duke to author the first book on data management in ML systems. We highlight several open research questions in this space, Morgan and Claypool publishers. I believe this book is available as a free PDF on academic networks as well. Three, check out tutorials and papers in this space. Sigmod, BLDB, ICD also, and I'm sure Cod, Comad, Cider, everyone in this space, they are publishing papers in this space. Tutorials at Sigmod and BLDB, some of these recent tutorials that I've lifted, they give you an overview of the landscape and the open challenges across these sorts of problems that I talked about. And so they are good starting points to identify interesting open questions that you can pursue in your research. Four, attend these topical workshops. If you go to Sigmod, the data management for end-to-end ML Dean and Human in the Loop Data Analytics, Hilda, are really good workshops to check out. There's also a new conference called MLSys, which is on ML systems. It brings together like seven or eight different communities in computing to work on building better ML systems. And so that's an exciting, eclectic venue that you can check out as well. There are panel discussions every year, and some of them are on ML systems and applications. I myself have run a couple of these panel discussions, one at Sigma Dean Workshop in 2018. We had folks like Mate Zaharia, Joe Gonzalez, and others, Mansi at attending. And again, in 2021, on data prep for ML, we had like Luna, Nihab, and Felix, and even VCs attending. So I've written blog posts about this. It's on the Sigma blog. Take a look at this and follow some of the thoughts that they've given about the problems in this space. But most important, in my opinion, apart from doing and publishing research, also work with actual practitioners, speak to them, collaborate with them, build real stuff. Data scientists, data analysts, ML engineers, ML ops engineers, domain scientists at your university, enterprise companies, web companies, cloud vendors, policy people, create open source artifacts, build systems, open source them, build data sets, make them publicly available for people to build upon. And I also like attending industry venues like Spark Data AI Summit, O'Reilly, Strata Data Science Conference when it was there, FOSTEM, some of my collaborators have attended that, and presenting some of our work, especially the open source stuff, so that practitioners can get to try it. And you can learn from the practitioners as well. So it's a virtuous cycle. Um, if you want to publish in this space, the regular research tracks are always good, but there's also new publication avenues that the database conferences have come up with. I was involved with creating and launching the scalable data science category as part of the PBLDB. And we've written a blog post about how PBLDB's data science category kind of worked for the first year. Take a look at that. It's in Sigma Directed. We've written, um, a pub published a paper with statistics about it as well. And it's not just BLDB. Now, Sigma also has 
its own uh, data science category. Um, sorry, for the slide. And you also have MLSIS, a new conference that I told you. KDD has had this applied data science track also, and I saw God's Comat also has applied data science, so it's great to see uh, conferences in this space encourage publications of this sort. So I hope the database community steps up to the grand challenge of the debification of ML AI. And to do this, we need to partner with folks in the ML AI data mining communities, systems world, HCI, PL, many other worlds, and partner with users in the main sciences and industry to translate our research to practical impact as well. But I'll stop. These are my terrific advisees that are doing all this stuff. Um, and a short plug for the Halajolu Data Science Institute that I mentioned. It's again, a new department. We've defined several clusters of areas and we've hired several faculty. We are now at almost 40 faculty, including 20 faculty that are full-time at HSI, and we are hiring continuously as well. We do have uh, data infrastructure and systems as a defined area, databases, systems for ML, data mining infrastructure, and so on. We're hoping to nurture and create more of these sorts of research topics and kind of incubate more and more kind of development of these sorts of venues as well. Um, and so it's not just for faculty and researchers. We also have defined and launched bachelor's, master's, online master's, and PhD programs in data science. So if you or if anyone you know is interested, feel free to take a look at this. Uh, HDSI is accepting all of these. And we also have postdoc positions. If any of you are interested in academic routes and want to do a postdoc, in the US, please do look at this as well. And as part of HDSI, I've also created new courses. And this is something that people who do this sort of intersectional research, I believe, should invest their energy into, especially academics. We have to kind of synthesize and unify these sorts of fields. And this is something that I've been doing at both the graduate level, data system for ML, and at the undergraduate level, systems for scalable analytics. And so I hope more of the faculty in the space who bridge these gaps between these areas also do so with new courses in this space. Okay, so let me see if I can move the slide. That brings us to the end of my talk. Like I said, all papers, blog posts, talk videos, code, data, everything is available on our lab web page, on the project web page. Please take a look at that. If you want to follow me and get updates about my research sooner, follow me on Twitter. And with that, I'll stop and I'd like to thank all of these sponsors of our group's research. And I'll take more questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, for it. So we'll start taking questions. Uh, there's an online question. Let's start with that. Let me put the slide deck over. Yeah. OK, question from Rekha. Is there a benchmark for data prep for system performance? control knobs, data size, federalism, transformation function types, and so on? That's a great question. I think um, from the standpoint of system performance, we haven't prioritized this because for many of these AutoML tools, getting them to work and reliably and accurately itself is a huge concern. But once that is settled, I think we need to expand these benchmark metrics to account for exactly what you're talking about, system metrics. And so I think that space needs to settle first. Like in the analogy would be like in the relational DBMS context, TPC metrics, um, the queries and the metrics that TPC defined have standardized that field. But that was because people understood what SQL workloads look like. We need something like that in the data transformation and data preparation for ML space as well. Any okay. questions from the audience? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that interesting talk. Uh, have you also considered uh, NoSQL databases uh, uh, in your, these examples uh, seem to be concentrating more on the relational databases. So have you considered the NoSQL databases too? That's my question. Yeah. Right. So the question is, um, are we using these sorts of systems for execution? So on the Cerebro side, we are not actually using any of these systems. We are using TensorFlow and PyTorch on regular clusters. If you are doing semi-structured data, so then key value stores and NoSQL stores can be useful for kind of managing that sort of data. Integrating ML into those sorts of systems can potentially be useful. 
Now, people have considered kind of applying ML for prediction tasks in the uh, tabular context, in the unstructured data context. But for semi-structured data, the question is, are there specific prediction tasks that are valuable? And so um, if that is the case, then yes, I think definitely integrating these ML sorts of tools into NoSQL stores will also be useful. I haven't studied it directly in my own research, but I can imagine based on the use cases for those sorts of prediction tasks, you can see those. Thank you. Okay, I had a question. Uh, so your hopper, could could some of those ideas apply in federated learning and uh, and then the privacy issues also come up? Uh, yeah? Yes, yes, that's absolutely true. So in federated learning, you basically have uh, the sharded data situation on steroids, right? So you have the data set that's now split globally and potentially across devices of all sorts of types. Now, typically federated learning uh, have their own custom commodity systems like TensorFlow, the Google folks came up with their own federated learning implementation. I don't think that space has converged yet, but I imagine the model hopping technique can be very useful there as well. Instead of sending data across devices, you can, you're basically sending models across devices. Um, the models themselves, whether they're going to be sent from one machine to another to retrain is a different question. Like in Hopper, we make the model visit all the shards. But typically in federated learning, that is not what is done. They have a global model, and then the exchange goes to only the global model. And then the global model comes only to the local device. Now, it's an interesting accuracy trade-off. Do you want to learn from multiple people's data only by exchanging with the global model? Or do you want them to be synchronized across multiple users as well? Um, I think there is an interesting intersection there that can be studied. Thank you, Arun. I don't see okay. any more questions, so uh, thank you very much. And we should thank the speaker once again. And I'm sure Arun will be happy to answer email questions or whatever. Uh, offline, Absolutely. Yeah? Thank you thank very you. much. Thank Thanks. Thank Goodbye, you for the opportunity well for coming to the talk and feel free to send me in. Thank you. Uh, so I just have a few announcements.